So I think it's one of the more difficult theories to understand in psychology, <clears throat> which might explain why uh, it's one of the most popular posts on our blog. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to give a summary of schema theory. And if you're um, <clears throat> struggling for ideas uh, on how to teach this, it, it might make a bit more sense. Or if you're a student trying to figure out uh, this theory, hopefully this, um, this explanation will, will help you make sense of what schema theory is all about and how you can write about it in your exams. So, um, by the end of this video, you'll know the key claims of schema theory. Hopefully, you'll, you'll comprehend the theory and you'll know how to evaluate it, which will mean you'll be able to write excellent exam answers if this comes up. We're going to use the, the same structure I've talked about in other videos um, when we're evaluating uh, theories or models in psychology. So, we start with the description, the evidence, applications, and limitations. So, the way to remember that is let's make a deal. And this is how we can evaluate theories. We describe the theory the evidence, the applications, and the limitations. So let's look at when we're describing schema theory, what are some of the key questions that we have to understand? Um, first of all, what is schema theory? What is it trying to explain? This first, then the next one is, second point would be, what is a schema? The definition of schema uh, is really important to the theory. Then we look at the characteristics, characteristics and functions of the schema, and finally, how they can influence our thinking and our behavior. So the other four things I think it's really important that you understand in order to give a really good description of schema theory. So first, let's look at what is schema theory. So I think this is a, a really important place to start when understanding any psychological theory is what is it trying to explain. And so schema theory is trying to explain how our minds organize information, um, information, knowledge, and memories. I would argue that those three things are the same thing. Information stored in our mind is knowledge and memory and knowledge are one and the same. But it sounds good when you use the rule of threes. So I, I, I use, usually use all three of them. Um, but that's what schema theory is. It's explaining, uh, it's a theory of how our minds organize uh, this information. And the way it organizes it is through schema. So one of the central claims is that we, we categorize, we organize all the information that we have in our memory. And we categorize them, we, we group this information into these schema. And, and this grouping, this categorization is going to influence um, the way we think. And that's also going to influence how we behave. Uh, the schema theory is a little different to other theories in that there wasn't one person that came up with the idea, but it's been contributed to by a number of different researchers. I think the three most notable are Bartlett, who was writing about it in the 1920s, Piaget around the same time, and Vygotsky a little later. Um, the other three notable contributors, but when we talk about schema theory, I think of it as um, all the ideas about schema that have come uh, out of cognitive psychology over the last 100 years. So it's not like, um, you know, uh, social cognitive theory, for example, by Bandura that was just one person, or Taj Valentino's social identity theory, um, the Sharif's realistic conflict theory. This is a uh, schema theory is uh, more general than that. It's been contributed to by uh, a lot of people. So we know like schema theory is trying to explain how we organize our information and, and it's organized by schema. So what, what is a schema? Um, the technical definition, it, it's a cluster, right? A grouping of related pieces of information, knowledge or memory stored in the mind. And I want to make it, use the word mind when you're talking about schema, not brain. Um, there's a distinction there. The brain is the biological part, right? The part you can touch. It's the neurons, the neurotransmitters, it's the tissue. It's the biological part. The mind is the the cognitive part, the thinking, right? It's it's the, the, the uh, it's what the brain, you, you use your brain for, right? The mind is what you use your brain for. So the I, I wouldn't, yeah, I think it's important that we use that terminology correctly. Um, schemas are also called a cognitive framework. So remember, think about a framework or a structure, how things are, are, are grouped and categorized. And so the schemas are, um, a schema are, are systems of categorizing and organizing that information in memory. Now this is getting a little bit abstract. So the metaphor I like to use is that of a filing cabinet. And if you know of the old um, library filing systems or like one of those old uh, filing cabinets, if you think about it, the whole cabinet is the mind, right? All of our all of our experiences, our, our life histories, our memories, all the knowledge that we have, that's the big that's all the, the file, all the file cabinet. And then one particular file would be a schema. Right, so it's a group of related um, pieces of information. So the individual files, the individual cards in that file, are, are specific pieces of knowledge, are specific memories, but they're grouped together 
into that file. Now, that's probably an old person's metaphor. So to use a more modern metaphor, we think about a computer and a hard drive, right? memory on a hard drive. So the, the hard drive where all the files are stored, where all the information is stored, think about that as the mind. And the schema are the folders where you group different individual files of information. And those individual files are the, the, the specific pieces of knowledge and memory, right? So they're all grouped together. Um, so this is just one, uh, it's a couple of metaphors that I like to use to explain what a schema is. If we think about other real life examples, if you think about people, right, we, we, we make generalizations about groups of people. So if you think, what do you think of when, when um, if you think of a Japanese woman? Now, if you've had no experience with Japanese women, um, Japan, and never seen movies, TV, anything, then you won't have any preconceived schema. You won't have a grouping or a cluster of information, knowledge, and memories. But if you've um, seen Memoirs of a Geisha, if you've traveled to Japan, if you've got Japanese friends, all those experiences will be grouped together in a Japanese woman schema, and that's what you, the, those sorts of images and thoughts would um, come to mind. Uh, and so, for example, the, the picture of uh, a kimono um, would be a very common one for people if, if when they think Japanese woman. Um, and everyone's experience is different, though. So everyone has different schema because our schema is the collection of our experiences. If we think um, another type of schema is a script schema. So a common example people use is when you go to a restaurant. You know what's going to happen. You, you, you know how to behave in a restaurant. And it's slightly different to how you'd behave in a wedding. And how you behave in a wedding and how you act is different to how you behave at a funeral because you know what's expected of you. You've been to those situations before and you, you know how it plays out. So you've got these schemas, you've got these group groupings of experience and memories about those places and how to behave that help to guide your behavior in those um, situations. Now, uh, think of psychology. Before you studied psychology, I'm sure you thought it was about mind reading, right? Your schema for psychology was probably pretty limited and was based on what you saw about TV uh, and what you saw in movies and you were thinking, man, psychology, cool. I want to learn how to read people's minds. That's what most people think who don't study psychology. Then when you start studying it, your schema becomes filled with the idea of um, brain, hormones, stereotypes, social psychology, cultural psychology, um, understanding behavior, all these more technical aspects of psychology. Um, so that's another good uh, good example of, of a schema. And, and think about what you've learned um, about a particular subject, and so you have a schema for that. Now, some advice and exams. Um, don't use these metaphors I've just talked about. Don't talk about a filing cabinet. Don't talk about a computer. Use academic language and the precise, precise vocabulary. Talk about them in the abstract. So why not? Why not use the metaphors? I've just done it, so why can't you? It's because of your audience. I'm using those metaphors to help people understand a pretty abstract concept. Now, when you write in your exam, you want to show that you understand the abstract concept of schema. You're writing to someone who knows a lot about um, schema, and they will be able to comprehend it and be able to assess how well you understand the concept of schema. If you're using those metaphors, it, it, I, I think it's going to suggest that you might not fully comprehend the idea of schema, and so you're having to use those concrete metaphors in order to, to explain what it means. So I think you're better to leave them out and explain it in the abstract, right? It's a, and so just use the definitions, right? It's a cluster of related pieces of information, um, memories, and knowledge, and it's how we uh, make sense and organize the world. They're also known as a cognitive framework. Talk about those things. Don't talk about the specific metaphors in your exam. All right, so we looked at what is schema theory, right? The, the ideas, and we've looked at the definition of schema. So now let's... And now, Carrying on with our summary of schema theory, we have to look at characteristics and functions. So these are a couple of other things that are really important in schema theory. So um, one of them is that they, they're long lasting. So they are collections of our uh, experiences and our knowledge and our memories. And so they build up over time. And because they're, they're collections of a lot of information, a lot of memories, they're pretty difficult to change. You know, once we get a, a, once, for example, we did develop a stereotype, stereotypes are a type of schema. Once we develop that generalization about a group of people, that generalization is probably going to be based on a lot of experience. Um, and when I say experience, I don't mean personal face to face. It could just be like what we've seen in the media, what we've picked up, what we've read, what we've learned, been told by other people. So it's quite difficult to change that because that's based on a, on a large, um, a lot of, you know, piece of information. They're not impossible to change. Right? As our experiences carry on and we fill our schema with, with new information, they, they can change. So there are two characteristics. Um, and then we get into functions. 
one of the most important functions I think of schema is they allow us to comprehend new information. So think about the uh, filing cabinets uh, and computer examples I was just talking about, right? So I was giving, trying to give a metaphor that uh, people would be able to relate to. Oh, I know how file, files work on a um, computer. And, and that would help you comprehend what a schema is because you can connect this idea of schema to that existing knowledge that you have. Now, that's why I had to use the computer metaphor because students wouldn't maybe not use hard copy files and file cabinets and know the old system of filing in li uh, libraries. So you don't have that, that existing schema to connect the new one to. So that's why I had to use the computer one as well. So one of the most important functions is they help us to comprehend uh, new information, which is yeah, improving our, our processing and comprehension. And another is that, you know, our world is complex. We are swimming in information. We are drowned in information all the time. Uh, and so schemas allow us to make sense of this. They allow us to simplify a really complex world. We group things into categories and, and that makes it um, easy for us to kind of navigate through the world. Um, <clears throat> and so schemas, as, as I've already talked about, are generalizations. Right, about situations, say for example, going to a wedding or people, which is a type of stereotype, um, and in different places. And humans are, are, a lot of cognitive psychologists say humans are cognitive misers. We don't want to use more cognitive thinking energy than we need to. And this is where schemas uh, come into it. Um, so, for example, um, Paul Bloom uses the example of a chair. Right, When I see a chair, I don't have to think, hmm. I wonder what that's for. I know it's for sitting because I've sat on a bunch of chairs before. Um, if I go to someone's house, they've got completely different glasses than what I use. But I know that if I want to drink, I can use that glass because it it fits that schema of a glass, and I don't. So I don't have to always be trying to make sense of this new information around me and these new things around me because I just connect them to what I already know, and that's going to help save my energy. And this is where. Um, you know, I don't want to think about 127 million different Japanese people as individuals. It's too hard. It's too complex. I'm a lazy man, so I'm going to just make a stereotype, right? They're very polite, like to eat sushi, um, and very respectful. Okay, that, that's now I know that's not true when I think about it a little bit more carefully. Um, you know, I, my wife's Japanese, my son's Japanese, right? So when I think about it more carefully, I know that that's not true, and it's a generalization. But when we do think about people, we do think about them in these. Um, generalized ways because it's it's easier uh, now finally we're looking at how schema can influence our thinking uh, and or our behavior so this is the fourth part in having a good description of schema theory um, so as I've just said comprehension I think this is one of the ways that schemas can influence our thinking um, they can they can help improve uh, our comprehension because we make sense of new information connecting it to existing knowledge and as I've just said these are like the metaphors that I, I've just used I use these metaphors because you know what they are so you can connect your new information about schema to this existing knowledge to help it make sense for you second example uh, of how schema can influence our thinking and behavior is through what we call confirmation bias now confirmation bias is when it's a tendency to focus on and remember details that are consistent with your existing beliefs in other words they're consistent with your exist existing schema and because that's easier too it's it's cognitively easier to um, find out and seek information that that supports what we already know Trying to confront challenging information and things that challenge our, our schema and challenge our memory and knowledge and beliefs, that's harder. It's harder to get our head around. And so there is a, a cognitive tendency for humans to avoid that and just focus on what's consistent with our schema, and that's called confirmation bias. So the schema, while it can help improve our comprehension of information, also can lead to this bias in thinking. And this, uh, in the realm of stereotypes, can help reinforce the stereotype, right? If you think about it, if you if you meet someone, we'll come back to the Japanese woman example. Uh, let's say you're hanging out with a few Japanese women, and a couple of them are behaving in a way that's consistent with your stereotype, and a couple of them are behaving in a way that are, are challenging and is quite different. Then there's a tendency there that you'd focus on the the behaviors, and you'd notice the behaviors that that are consistent with your existing beliefs about how Japanese people behave, and that's going to reinforce that stereotype for better or worse. So this is uh, one way that that schema can influence um, our cognition. Now the next point. So we've looked at uh, describing 
um, schema theory. Now we look at the evidence. What are the studies that support these claims that I've just explained? One of the classic ones, that I'll, I'll put more videos out later that go into these studies in more detail. Uh, but you may be familiar with the Bransford and Johnson, the laundry schema study. They had participants um, listen to a very general passage about doing laundry, although laundry was never mentioned. And what they found is that when they did, when the participants knew it was about laundry, they um, uh, rated their comprehension as higher and they remembered more details. And so what it shows is that activating a schema about something can help our comprehension because we can connect the new information to our existing knowledge, our existing schema. And that's going to help us comprehend it and remember it better. Uh, and so, yeah, without any background knowledge of something it's, and with, to connect to, it's difficult to comprehend information. Another one uh, looking at confirmation bias and stereotypes was Stoner L. Now in this study they had participants listen to a basketball game and half the participants were shown a picture of a black athlete and said this is the basketball player I want you to listen, listen to him play and the other half were shown a picture of a white athlete and they were shown this is the player I want you to listen and uh, so of course they weren't watching the game they were listening to it but half thought he was black half thought he was white. After the game, they were asked to make a judgment about his play. And this was playing on the stereotype that um, black athletes are more athletic and white athletes are um, have a higher basketball quote-unquote IQ, right? They, um, white athletes make smart plays, black athletes make athletic plays. So they were looking at the stereotype. And what they found was that that, that um, was true on average for participants. Those who thought they listened to a white player judged them as making more athletic, uh, sorry, the white player as showing more hustle and making smarter plays and the black athlete as being more athletic. So activating the schema led to the confirmation bias. So in this case it affected the judgments, right? The judgments of, of other people by the participants. And a really similar study um, using similar methodology was by Cohen and they had the, this was the waitress librarian study. Um, they had half the group watch a video and told this uh, woman on a date with her husband. Um, half were told she was a waitress. The other half were told she was a librarian. After they watched the video, they were asked to write down what they remembered of the video. And the results showed that those that thought she was a waitress remembered details from the video that were consistent with a waitress um, stereotype. Uh, and those that thought she was a librarian um, consistent with the librarian stereotype. So very similar to Stone et al, but it's shown that activating schema leads to confirmation bias, and in this case, affecting the memory. So the, the memory was improved of, they measured the memory, so the um, yeah, memory of uh, the information consistent with the stereotype was better as a result, presumably, of the um, schema activation, which influenced the confirmation bias. So there are three studies, then we get, right, so we've got the description of schema theory, we've got the evidence, now we get to what are the applications, and, and one application I'll talk about, which I think is arguably the most important for schema theory, is literacy, teaching kids how to read. So as we've looked at um, schema can help us comprehend new information, and reading is about comprehending, right, understanding what we are reading, and so schema theory and the concepts associated with it have been helped to develop reading programs for kids. Um, and a lot of reading strategies like um, activating prior knowledge, getting kids to think about what they know about a topic before they start reading. Um, these are some practical strategies to help kids learn how to read that have come out of research into schema. Um, and another, in terms of uh, teaching, you know, it is about developing schema. The more you know about a subject, the easier it is to comprehend that subject. Um, and this is my approach in teaching psychology as well. You know, it's get the content, get the knowledge. The more you know, the easier it's going to be to comprehend new stuff. Finally, we come to limitations. So we've got the description, evidence, application, limitations. And schema theory is a very, very difficult theory, I think, to evaluate. It's, it's not because the, the concept is abstract and it's, um, yeah, it's very tricky. So I'm just going to pose one key question here um, to help you think about evaluating schema theory. I don't want to give you the answer because if you regurgitate um, my explanation of a limitation and exam answer, uh, the examiner is going to know it. It's it's you're not going to give very high critical thinking points. So um, I'd rather pose the question: Have you come up? There's rain, loads of different ways you can answer this question. So then it's going to be really clear in your exam answer that this is your thinking. So if you think, okay, a good theory is going to be testable. We we have to be able to test theories. Now think about there is there are quite a few factors when we talk about schema that are going to influence how easy it is to test the claims of schema theory. 
So if we go back, and so you need to go back and think carefully. This is limit. This is critical thinking, so it will take some time. Go back and think, what were those claims of schema theory that I talked about uh, in terms of how they can influence behavior and even the definition of schema? And why might this be tricky to test? Right? And so if you can come up with a good paragraph about that, and you've got everything else included um, in this video, in an essay evaluating schema theory, uh, you're on track to write a, a really good essay. So, recapping. Evaluating theories, let's make a deal. Summarizing schema theory, explaining the evidence. Now, IB psychology students, if you're writing a short answer response, I think you'll find, if you're asked to outline or describe schema theory, describing it in the detail that, that we've talked about in this video, and with one supporting study to highlight one um, of those claims, that's all you need to do. If you're writing about the essay, then you would add the um, maybe a second study, applications and limitations. So I hope that video helped un uh, you understand schema theory in a little bit more detail. It is a really tricky um, one to grasp and I do recommend um, taking your time with it and, and trying to relate it to as many concrete examples as you can. Um, if you need more help, subscribe to our blog. There's, um, this is all written down there as well. Um, post questions to our Facebook group and uh, check out our store for more resources that might help. All right, thanks.